Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I so appreciate the music being played in the back of those communion moments, and she tries to stump me every week, but that is the love of God and grace that's greater. Am I correct? Amen. You guys notice those, those hymns in the background? Yeah, we play this little game. Thank you. Anyone else cut their teeth on those old hymns? Amen. All right. Well, now I'm going to take you back to your childhood for a little bit. Take you back when you were maybe a teenager and um, you decided that you wanted to go into the woods. So you rounded up your tent, uh, maybe some snacks. You talked your mom into some marshmallows and maybe some of that government baloney that we used to get. <laughs> Stuck it in some wax paper. <laughs> rounded up a few of your pals and, of course, your homemade spear, right? Because you're heading into the wilderness with your boys. Of course, the wilderness was our backyard, and with a big giant floodlight on the back that kind of lit it up nice and safe for us. And then once I got married and, married and, and doing life with my bride, we decided we were going to go in the wilderness again, and this time we defined that one as a fifth wheel with two TVs and air conditioning, right? <laughs> Amen? Glamping? Yes? And of course, the wilderness was a very safe and well-lit, well-managed state park, right? Who knew? But maybe you've been in a wilderness, a real one. I can uh, tell you that one of my favorite shows to watch on television is this show called Alone. I'm not sure if you've ever seen it, but for whatever unknown reason, these people decide to get dropped off by themselves in, the li in literally in nowhere land, in, in the wilderness, not even water. And it's amazing for me to watch them and to see how they deal with the wilderness. Now, regardless whether it was my backyard or a state park or this known, unknown place in Antarctica where they're at this season in alone, it's a physical place. It's a tangible place. It's a place where they can drop you off. It's, it's a destination on a map. And more importantly, it's a place where rescuers can go find you. They can search for you. We've all seen newscasts where people have been lost in the wilderness and they send out the search parties and the helicopters and the dogs to try to find you. That wilderness is real, tangible place that you can get to. And typically that this wilderness, especially in this, this, this show alone, is that it's not a place of comfort. Not at all. Or ease. It's harsh. And there's, there's isolation and Nobody truly wakes up and says, Heavenly Father, could you please place me in this unknown place, wilderness, where I struggle for my survival and have no water? <laughs> nobody, nobody asks for that. What happens, though, as you in our real life, if you've ever been lost in one or any of these shows, is that after a while, their mind starts to take over. And fear shows up right on time with, of course, his close cousin, Impatience. And what happens is you'll see them make poor decisions and their mind takes over dealing with fear and worry and anxiety. And now what was a challenge to them now, it's a, am I even going to survive this? Am I even going to get out of this place called the wilderness? Everything is geared to getting out and being rescued. Over the next seven weeks, we are going to explore a different kind of wilderness. It's not a physical one. It's a place that can feel very similar to a physical wilderness. However, it's going to be a spiritual wilderness is what we've been talking about and we will be talking about today and the next six weeks. A wilderness that every follower of Jesus will experience. I love to sit up here and tell you, oh, it's going to be rainbows and sunshine the moment we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but I would be lying to you. It's the reality, right? We, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful track, but it's not necessarily easy. And regardless of your age, students, there's a wilderness for you as well. Some of you, sadly enough, are, are in some now. But we, nobody's exempt. If you are a follower of Jesus, a professed Christ follower, living to be a proper image bearer of Jesus, not only will you experience a wilderness, it is necessary for us to experience 
a wilderness. Why? Because God does his work in us through the wilderness. Through the wilderness. We've all had those moments feeling alone. Like you're by yourself, that you don't know anybody and you're just there. It's a time of testing, a very difficult time for God trying to reprioritize reprioritize things in your mind and things in your heart. Possibly um, your spiritual wilderness could strip you of comfort. And the only good thing about that is that also there go the distractions as well. There are times when we are forced in these wilderness moments to, to face our own weakness, to face the sin in our lives, the areas of our lives where we are out of alignment with God and his teachings and in who he is and what he has commanded for us to do. Many times we're going to be confronted with areas of our lives that need not only agreement with God that it's wrong, but a confession and a decision, a repentant repentant attitude to turn around away from it and, and go the other direction. But there's also times where we have this incredible opportunity, although it may not feel like it at the time, to be able to draw closer to God. To be able to see him and to hear him and experience him in ways that may not have been possible by any other way except for your personal, specifically designed wilderness. And don't miss this. And I'm speaking to myself here because this, I, I'm just crawling out of one now, to be quite honest and transparent. You can be in the wilderness from a four bedroom, three bath, air conditioned pool home with a refrigerator full of food surrounded by your loved ones. Now, before we start this sermon series on the wilderness, I've compiled, and it's not an inclusive list, but I compiled a list of some um, helpful and practical parameters, so to speak, for lack of a better word, to be able to help guide us. Now, these are not going to give us the exact answers, to the questions you may have in your wilderness, but that's your wrestle, it's your limp. But there are some practical things that we can keep in the front of our mind to help us maintain the patience that we need and the teachability that's going to be required for us to be able to not only go into the wilderness, but receive what God has for us. Amen? And we'll list a couple of them today. Here's the first one, that Jesus is still present and aware of you and the wilderness. Boy, this is a hard one here. This is the one that we really need to kind of grasp. I've been here. Hello? Are you there? Do you hear me? Are you watching this? Do you see my tears? Do you feel my pain, my worry, my fear, my anxiety? My... Do you see it all? Do you see I'm losing my mind? Do you see I'm taking it out on my family? Hello, could you light up my room? Just me? Right? Right? Are my, did I do something wrong? Are my prayers hitting the ceiling and coming back? Oh, yeah, I forgot this one time in the third grade. I forgot. <laughs> right? We might feel alone, but we are not. Amen. We might feel isolated, but you are not. We may feel that God is mad at us. Now, oh, that's a big one. Right? God's mad at us, and we're waiting for the other shoe to drop, and here he is coming to to give me what I deserved 15 years ago on biblical, on theological thought. God can't love you any more or any less than that that moment of graciousness where he called you unto himself. Then the work begins. Because sanctify us, make us holy every day, make us look more and more like Jesus. So let me give you a couple of verses, both Old Testament and New Testament, to, to assure you that God is aware and present in our moments of wilderness. The first one, Deuteronomy chapter 2, talking to Moses, says, Israelites are wandering around in the wilderness. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> he knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years. The Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. Not only do we see God's presence and awareness, if you read it close, we see God's provision. God provides for us in the wilderness as well. And this, keep in mind, this is a they're disobedient at this point. This is the grace of God. 
There's grace of God here. Also, New Testament, just Jesus speaking. <clears throat> the last half of the Great Commission. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And you, and behold, I am what? With you always till the end of the age. Early church was born. Holy Spirit showed up. Pentecost came. They're, they're fired up. The Holy Spirit lit the flame. The church is starting to move. Jesus knows the difficulty facing them. So he tells them and he assures them, go do what I've empowered you to do and understand I'm aware of it and I will never leave you nor forsake you and I'll be with you right to the very end of the age. Amen? <clears throat> so look at this. So as we read those, and especially this is a big one for us because we have to believe, really believe that Jesus is present and with you in that wilderness that makes all the difference in the world. Next one's reasons differ. Everybody's wilderness, there's a reason that's different. Not always, not always is it a result of our sin and rebellion. Make no mistake, sometimes it is. Scriptures, scriptures can show us that, <clears throat> but not all the time. When it is, because of our sin and rebellion, God is faithful to show us while we're in that wilderness. And when we finally get back into the clearing and, and we're out of this wilderness, you can be certain that God has addressed it and spoken specifically to you about this area of sin or rebellion or disobedience. And he's done so through his word and through his Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and often our exit out of the wilderness will involve confession and repentance. And watch this. A new level of obedience. Now often it isn't about sin. <clears throat> it's about God himself taking the initiative to us, to his children, because he's got plans for us. It's God's initiative to put us in these places to teach us and to prepare us and to remind us and, and to mature us and to reprioritize things in our lives so that we will be ready for the next leg of the journey that he has in store for you, the very reason he redeemed you. Amen? Israel was put in the wilderness, if you remember. It wasn't to deplete the labor force in Egypt. It's pretty clear in Scripture. It's go out into the wilderness so what? You can worship me. And their lack of worship kept them there for 40 years. So reasons differ for each and every one of our wildernesses. Next one's remain patient. And this isn't a, a passive sit around, twiddle your thumbs, waiting for a burning bush while you gripe, moan, and complain. <laughs> that could only extend, that could only extend um, your time in the wilderness. Thank you, brother. Let me, let me open this. One thing we learned when we're on tour with people is that you, you hand them a water bottle without a top on it. <laughs> In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have to be patient. <laughs> Perfect. All right? Um, and the reason for the patience is that our, the very wilderness could be trying to mature our patience. It's a hard one, right? And patience means to wait with this expectant faith, a faith that has prayer and meditation and study and quietness and listening. Because what happens is if the moment we lose our patience, our mind kicks in, and if you're a control person... Now you put your hands to it, and you try to figure out your own way out. And then you start to make bad decisions. Ever been there? Yeah. Right? I can tell you it only extends to wilderness. And trying to figure out a way to squirm out from underneath this pressure that God has given you. You're trying to get out of it. This is uncomfortable. I don't want to be here. No kidding. It's called the wilderness. Nobody wants to be there, but we have to remain patient. In this wilderness. He's a good, good father. He doesn't put you there just to slap you around for good measure. 
He's got you in there for a godly, heavenly purpose, and he's got his godly, powerful, sovereign hand upon you and it. Amen? All right, also, length differs. The length of your wilderness is going to differ. Some are very long. You're going to see a character sketch on Paul in this series where he operated his ministry, I believe, from a, a complete wilderness, from Tarsus all the way to Rome. And you're going to see some that are short. You're going to see some that are days, like Jonah, and who we're going to talk about today, Peter. Now, regardless of the length, understand it is God's timing. He is never early. Funny how that works, right? Never early, but he's never late. And God will and can determine the length of our wilderness. And again, keep in mind, God is a, a good, good dad. He never, never puts us in one or leaves us in one without godly purpose. And the last one to keep in mind is results differ. Each and every one of us are growing at a different pace and a different rate. And all of us struggle with certain things in our lives. So wildernesses are specifically designed uniquely for you because God knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows your past. And he knows the things that we struggle with. Every child of God is unique and different, praise Jesus. Each one of our wanderings are designed specifically for you. It might be a change of heart, maybe even a complete heart replacement, a heart surgery. It might be maybe for a time of healing. You've been hurt, kicked around, injured. It's a time of refreshment and a time of healing to, to kick off the scars and to let it properly heal. Maybe it's a time to change your mind about something. Shifting of my attitude. A removal of fear, doubt, worry, anxiety that ought not be there. At the very least, it's, it's me reprioritizing things in my life. More importantly, reprioritizing my relationship with Jesus. It could be a maturing of a character trait. Or, or a removal of a bad character trait. It could be maturing a gift that God has given you that now he's going to hone in and perfect because it's going to be needed in the next place that he has for you. The results for each of these wilderness wanderings differ, but all of them are designed to, to readjust and, and to realign and, and to redirect and to ultimately reprioritize who we are in our relationship with Jesus. So here's our personal app that I want to keep up here uh, for this week in your private time. How do you handle your wilderness? Some of us are in one today. Some of us are just coming out of one. Some of us are headed for one that we don't even know yet. But how do you handle your wilderness? What's your go-to? What's your default? Now, we're, the first character we're going to look at today is Peter. And we're going to see how, how Peter does with these, these practical things. And the story of Peter is a very common one. Everybody knows it, right? You guys think you have a hard time with your reputation? Can you imagine Peter? Right? I say Judas, everybody thinks betrayer. I mention the word Peter, everybody says denier. And then it would be recorded in the best-selling book that will survive time. We're going to talk about that Peter. This is the Peter that declared loyalty to no end with Jesus. He declared loyalty and commitment and devotion when it was safe to do so, when it was comfortable, when it was prosperous. And then what we see Peter do is that he, he disavows. He disavows all knowledge, not only of what Jesus is doing and what Jesus has done. Peter takes it to a personal level and says, I don't even know the man. Whoo. Let's look at Peter's wilderness and unpack it for the purpose of, of us getting some application pieces that we can apply to our own life that we might be able to recognize that through Peter. What can I personally learn from Peter's wilderness? First thing, we, again, Jesus is present and aware. Let's look at the story, Matthew 26. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Jesus knows it's going to happen. Jesus is well aware 
of what is coming down the street for Peter, and he throws a rooster in for good measure. You want affirmation? How about a rooster crowing at night? Mark 16 says this, but go tell his disciples, watch this, this is fantastic, and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as you're told. And Peter. He could have said John, Matthew, anybody. Jesus was aware of the wilderness that Peter was in for these last three or four days. Just bearing down on his soul of what he did as he denied Jesus. Remember, they had just finished dinner. It's a great Passover meal. Jesus introduces the new covenant. Everybody's excited. Look at a couple questions, but they're okay. Scripture says they actually sang a hymn as they walked toward the Mount of Olives. And Jesus tells not just now Peter, but he tells all of them that all of you will fall away because of who I am, because of what I'm going to do, because of what I've already done and said. Peter says, never going to happen. Not me. Uh-uh. Maybe the other guys. That'll never happen, Jesus. Jesus assures Peter, oh, yes, it will. Oh, yes, it will. And upon Jesus' resurrection, Jesus is still well aware of Peter. Go tell the others and Peter. Jesus was saying this, I see you, Peter. I see you. I saw you. I never lost sight of you. I was aware of it then. I'm aware of it now. And Jesus has real great plans for the restoration of Peter. Jesus is aware and present. Next thing's reasons differ for going into a wilderness. Let's pick it up, verse 73. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And some gospel accounts say Jesus actually made eye contact. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And what? He went out and wept bitterly. I said, reasons differ. Here's the start of Peter's wilderness right here. Peter's wilderness began as a consequence of his denial of Jesus. We can't deny that his immediate denial, the rooster crowed, and there goes Peter into this moment of wilderness. Now, Jesus had a specific result for Peter. Peter doesn't know that yet. All Peter sees is Peter. Peter's denial played a part in this wilderness. Because Jesus knew the conditions of Peter's heart, and, and, but Peter didn't even know the condition of his own heart. Let's go into the remaining patient part of our wilderness. John 21, 3 says this. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. First, we see that Peter has influence. Peter has leadership skills. We're gonna, this is impatience on Peter's part, to which he convinces the other ones too. See, they were told to go to this place. They were told, go and wait. Go here specifically and hold on. Peter has a chest, a heart, and a mind full of denial. He's probably played it back a thousand times in his mind. He's already wrote his own narrative on what a failure he is. And he's sitting there. He smells the sea. He sees the nets and he sees the boats. And he knows that back there where I used to operate, it was safer. It was okay. I was in control. Less is expected of me back there. I want to go back there. So he says, I'm going fishing. I'm going back. It's easy to turn and run from our wilderness. It's, it's one of the first things we do. How do I get out of this? I want to run. I want to put my hands through. It's uncomfortable. It's very easy to attempt to get out of our own wilderness and, and go back to a safer time, a time where we thought was better. Jesus has already told them, put your nets away, son. 
And I know you went and fished last night and you caught nothing. No pun intended. You netted zero in your new life. Through my mind, it just, it just came there. But <laughs> Peter, there's, there's nothing for you back there. I got, I made you for more. You're going to catch men, Peter. Jesus already knew that. Impatience during wilderness can cause us to make bad decisions. Let's look at the length. John 21, verse 13 and 14. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the death or the dead. Here, here comes the length. Lengths differ. Understand that this relationship, this conversation that Jesus was going to have with Peter, a very difficult one, maybe the one that you are waiting to have with Jesus, it was started with a very warm, gracious, welcoming, warm breakfast after a cold, dark night of whatever it was out there with warm fish on a beach. That's God's grace. See, but wilderness times can differ from each of us. Again, it can be long like Paul or Jeremiah, but it can be short like Jonah or Peter. The length of the wilderness, regardless of how long it is, is controlled by God. Please understand that. He's a sovereign, providential God, and he knows exactly what he's going to do, when he's going to do it, and how long it's going to last. I can tell you this. The faster learner we are, sometimes the quicker we get out. It's just me. Like, you didn't really mean that. Let's try that again, right? Length differs, but I can tell you that it ends the moment Jesus says it ends. Sometimes it feels like we're in an extended wilderness. We are hoping for a short one, and we're still in it. Five, ten years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years later, who knows? But is there a lesson to be learned that you refuse to hear? Are you putting it away and going, no, that's not me. It's too hard. It's too difficult. I got all my reasons for not wanting to believe that. No, I'm not ready. No, I'm not teachable. Okay, let's try. How long can you go? God will get what he needs from his children. Are you patient in your wilderness? Long or short, either way, there's a specific result that God is after, and you're staying in it until he gets it. The results can differ. Verse 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know how you know everything and you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, well, then feed my sheep. Results differ. See, Jesus said, Peter, do you agape me? Do you unconditionally love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Unconditionally, Peter, you've devoted your life to me, committed, dedicated, that kind of agape love, Peter. And Peter says, sure, um, phileo, you, you, I, I phileo love you. I, I brotherly love you. That's where we get the word Philadelphia, by the way. The, brother of, the, the city of brotherly love. Jesus says, you missed it, Peter. You missed it. <laughs> Do you unconditionally love me, Peter? Do I have the whole of your heart, priority, commitment, dedication, devotion? Sure, we're, we're brothers. Second time. Now, if you're a scholar and you read the rest of this story, Jesus changes his word next. Okay, am I your brother? Jesus uses phileo. See what Jesus did? He met him. He met him in his wilderness. See, because Jesus needed Peter to understand that there was a heart change needed. There was a priority needed to happen in Peter's life. Jesus needed to hear the commitment, the dedication, the devotion, and to I'm all in, Peter, because you went all out earlier. Peter's restored, wonderfully restored. Peter becomes a leader in the early church. Preaches one of the most powerful, Holy Spirit-filled sermons as a result of Pentecost. Leads the church through difficult times. And then he gets in two epistles written that the whole world will read forever. <laughs> God is so good. <laughs> Peter so understands that he is not equal with Jesus, he has to be crucified upside down. That's the restoration. So here's my challenge. The wilderness is going to happen. We're not exempt. And we have to understand that God is aware and present. That your reasons for going in may differ. The results may differ. The length may differ. 
But we have to remain patient with this understanding that God has it, has me, loves me, and he's trying to teach me a lesson. So back to our personal application. I changed the words a little bit. How will you now? How will you handle your wilderness? And, and before we leave today, um, if you would, anybody who's currently in one now, can you just raise your hand? I want to see your face because uh, sometimes I need new material for prayer. A lot of it sounds just like me. I, I see him. I see him. Amen. I see him. There will be people here to help pray with you, to kind of help figure out where you're at, maybe where you might be lacking in, in this wilderness, or maybe even share some of the things that God's done for you in this time. Wilderness is tough, but necessary for our growth. You've seen the hands raised around this room. God is actively moving and changing the hearts of his people because he's a good God. He promised to do so. I pray as we move through this week, and even this morning, we would really understand that the wilderness we find ourselves in is because it's a loving God. He's not in it to punitively punish his children. He's a good, good father with a great heart that sometimes we don't understand. The difficulties of our wilderness can blind us and allow us not to see the loving, caring hand of a dad. I've walked out of my own wilderness here. For those of the men that have walked with me these past two or three months have been difficult. But when I came out of it, it wasn't a giant sermon that I got. It was this simple thing. I'm going to do something new. And I said, I don't want to. Back in. I'm going to do something new. I need you to trust me in a level you really haven't been trusting me. Hard words to hear. But I stand here today looking for the new. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. You want to do something new in all of us. You want to improve who we are. You want to sanctify us, make us look more like your son. I ask for teachable hearts, for ears that want to hear and eyes that need to see the frailties and the sin in our own lives and that we recognize the move of your spirit in these moments of wilderness. Allow us to lay down our compasses and, and lay down our tools and allow you, Father, to maneuver through us, in us, for us, and do new things with us. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.